I'm Connor Wolf and welcome back to another episode of Forgotten Oscar Films. And this week we're going to be looking at the 1968 class of films, uh, making I guess 20 episodes since we started with 1988 and we've been working backwards, having a lot of fun, fun with the series, and I'm glad you guys are too. Um, but if you're new to the series, what I do every single week is I look at a crop of Best Picture nominees that I pick one that I feel has been forgotten to time. A movie that at its time was seen as one of the top five movies of the year, according to the Academy, but unfortunately for some reason or another has maybe had less of an impact in some of these movies, for example, including Rachel Rachel, uh, the movies we're looking at today, I've never even heard of. So it was interesting to sort of look back. I talked about the Oscar histories, the five nominees, because it's so crucial to understand where this film was at its time, sort of the, the time uh, in the 60s in this case. Um, and then also give my thoughts on the film and try to answer that central question as to why it's been forgotten. Um, but jumping into my five nominees, uh, the first one, which was sort of seen, seen as the presumed winner, um, early in the Oscar season was The Lion in the Winter. Um, as I talked about in the last episode, the 60s um, very much was uh, dominated by the sense of um, English films, very much dominated American films, and since it was sort of an English craze, Beatles came out and in 64, My Fair Lady, a British musical, won Best Picture that same year. Um, and this was uh, similar to the, the movie last week, Anne of the Thousand Days, so I'm a, a British movie about a king starring two heavyweights, in this case being um, Peter O'Toole, who's been nominated twice before. Um, this, was, this was his third nomination. Uh, he's the starring character of Lawrence of Arabia, which won Best Picture, um, and then Catherine Hepburn, who has already won three Oscars, I believe, at this time. So she's a really huge Oscar fa favorite um, about a king, sort of with sort of, um, interesting witty dialogue and sort of maybe a little more of a modern take on it while still having all that lavish period detail. So that seems to be like the front runner, um, especially because um, Peter O'Toole never won before, um, and it won the DGA, and almost in, and in the 60s, if you won the DGA, you almost certainly won the Best Director Oscar, and then this time, um, only recently has that been a split. It's very rare that the Best Director and Best Picture don't line up. Um, so if you won DGA, there's a high likelihood you're going to win Best Director, and if you won Best Director, you're probably going to win Best Picture. So with the DGA awards before the Oscars, giving it to the uh, director of The Lion in the Winter. It seemed like it was going to win, but there was a surprise upset to Oliver. Um, and this was the actual best picture. It was a British musical, um, once again, so it's not that much of a surprise, but it is from director Carol, Carol Reed, who is actually an established director in Hollywood and has been for um, decades, and maybe that was the reason why they wanted to give it to, to him. Um, you know, he's just like a third man, um, for example. And many other movies uh, that I'm just forgetting off the top of my head, but he's an acclaimed, acclaimed actor for sure. Um, and, and it was always a strong contender, but really a lot of people thought it was either Funny Girl or The Lion in the Winter. And, and Funny Girl was another nominee that did not win. Only got one, um, one uh, win for Barbara Streisand. Um, and this was sort of her movie in a lot of ways. Despite being directed by William Wyler, an Oscar favorite, who's been one best director three times, I've covered on him on Masters of Controlled Chaos, a really incredible um, director. You can check out that episode. Um, but this was actually her first um, film performance. It's based on a Broadway musical. This was her very first film movie because she was so connected to, to Fanny Bryce, the character on stage and the, and the character in this movie. I'd already seen this movie. I, I covered this movie for the William Wyler episode. Um, and this, one, this pattern, I think, actually sort of represents the Oscars this year where Barbara Streisand won for Best Lead Actress, but... Catherine Hepburn also won for Best Lead Actress, The Lion in the Winter. This is the first time this has ever happened in the Best Actress category where there's actually been a tie, a split vote, and this is the last time we've seen an acting category split. Um, there was one in the 30s and one here and then never again. You know, we do see things in some technical categories. Most recently in 2013, there was a split for Best Sound Editing, I believe, for Skyfall and Zero Dark Thirty. Um, but for this one, for example, this was kind of a, a very literal representation of maybe the Oscars split, the, the old and the new. Um, there's people who want to represent the ingenue of Barbara Streisand, but also represent the incredible performance in Catherine Hepburn, giving her sort of her three and a half Oscars, if you guys would say, but really, really four, because they tied and they both got Oscars in this sense. But maybe that was the split that allowed Oliver to win, was that people really enjoyed Funny Girl, um, but also people really enjoyed The Lion in the Winter, and that allowed Oliver to get right through. Who knows? Um, but then the other two nominees, the first one being Romeo and Juliet. This was a massive success at the time, um, mostly because uh, a lot of the other film adaptations of Romeo and Juliet didn't feel necessarily authentic because oftentimes they start adults. This one, however, started um, teenagers, uh, young people, so it felt a little bit more realistic. A very huge success at the time. Um, a lot of people remember, remember this one. I almost went with this one because 
I didn't know too much about it, but I actually had already seen it because it did, I did see it in class um, in school. So uh, I think in the eighth grade we saw this, and then in the ninth grade we also did Romeo and Juliet, and we saw um, the Leonardo DiCaprio, Baz Luhrmann, uh, Claire Danes one. Um, so it's still Romeo and Juliet. It still has that sort of name brand recognition, and it was one of the most popular movies of the year. And I think got in as sort of the we often see the popular movie of the year, the highest grossing movie of the year get into a slot, I think that this was this year's slot. And it actually maybe had, it wasn't the biggest movie of the year, things like 2001 was huge, Rosemary's Baby was very big as well, even The Odd Couple, for example. But those ones were released a little bit earlier. And I think this one was released uh, later, was big at its time, and then maybe recency, recency bias sort of pushed over the ledge. That's kind of my theory. And then we have Rachel Rachel, um, sort of just happy to be nominated kind of thing, um, an independent movie. But the tra traction really came from um, first time director, Paul Newman, and the star of the movie, Joanne Woodward, who happened to be his wife, um, definitely represented, I think, the upcoming themes that Hollywood studio movies would tackle, and really this sort of transition between the themes that have only been tackled in independent cinema, now being sort of directed, still on a smaller independent scale, by Hollywood stars, and then um, eventually, in a few years, we'll be seeing actual Hollywood studios um, backing these kinds of movies and putting these uh, movies out um, on the regular. Um, so now, uh, transitioning into my thoughts, um, I really was surprised by this movie, and I think a lot of people had the same sort of reaction because maybe a little bit forgotten, um, despite being sort of directed by Paul Newman, a huge star, and then his longtime wife, Joanne Woodward, who has, you know, many Oscar, Oscar nominations, as it was a big star of her time as well, um, so I, of course I do know. Um, She's not some of these leads that you know have maybe been forgotten to the wayside. She has someone that has some brand name recognition. Um, but what I really enjoyed about this movie, kind of like I talked about before, was that they do tackle a lot of modern themes, um, things like uh, abortion, lesbianism, sort of sexual repression, um, awkwardness, um, general depression. Um, I think that they, they're all the sort of. Uh, intricately sort of tied in and weaved in and talked about and discussed in this movie. And it all sort of relies on the back of, I think really two things, I think Paul Newman's direction um, and Joanne Woodward's uh, stellar performance really. Uh, she, Woodward, uh, Joanne, this is an incredible job playing Rachel, who's really a, a unique character because um, she's sexually repressed in the sense that she's very much, um, I guess, career repressed and life repressed, I guess you would say, because she doesn't really like this sort of small New England town that she's in, and she just wants to really find different things and doesn't want to be sort of strapped to her mother. Um, it's very interesting to see because she's 35 years old, but she's portrayed like she's maybe the modern day 42 or something like that. Um, she would at least be 40 if this movie was made today. Um, but, but I guess in the 60s it was a little uh, more common, of course, to get married a little bit earlier. So 35 was appropriate. But um, not only are the themes tackled interesting and, and modern and, and, and I wouldn't say unique because they're, I guess, more tackled in much more modern films, but at the time it was definitely unique, I think. Um, but I actually I was surprised at how it wasn't actually, at least in my opinion, insensitive. I think there was some sort of unfortunate, I guess, um, negatives in terms of, I think there was a reliance on trauma sometimes to explain it and, and flashbacks. Um, but what Paul Newman really does is reliance on visual storytelling. He doesn't sort of tell you everything. A lot of times there's, uh, we really understand what's going on in uh, Joanne, uh, Rachel's head, the character played by Joanne Woodward. Um, because we, we see her um, talk, sort of have these sort of thoughts in, in her monologues sometimes, um, but we also see her sometimes, there's a sequence where, it's almost like a dreamlike sequence where we see her imagine what she would be like if she just died and got hit by a car or shot and sort of got pulled away. Um, oftentimes she's, the way we see the movie is through her eyes and uh, the anxiety she feels are oftentimes um, heightened to an extreme degree. Um, uh, you know, the title, of course, is, you know, not coincidence, Rachel, Rachel, the two different sort of sides of her, one that wants to be sort of free and open and tries to be and then gets her heart broken, and then the other side that um, tr um, is sort of more the conservative reserve side that she's sort of the face that she's putting on. There's two sides of the Rachel, not control, uh, coincidence storytelling, but I'll, uh, uh, coincidence title. But I was impressed by Paul Newman's storytelling, um, just the way he moves his camera, just the way he a edits things, I think it's a little bit more of a modern paced edit in a sense. Um, there's a great sort of religious scene um, um, where it's very sort of trippy and, and it, I think he does a great job of capturing anxiety um, and really putting us in the mind of, of Rachel. And I was really very, very impressed by this movie. It's one that I think it's very hard to track down. I had to um, dig around, uh, but 
if you do, uh, if you are able to find sort of a good quality um, uh, version, of it, I do highly recommend it. I think this is one of my favorites of uh, old on old so far. I was very impressed. Um, so why has this been forgotten? It's kind of hard to say because this is, does feel modern. Um, but I think that sort of the assumption I've made is that a lot of times when people remember movies, they remember their favorite movies of that year. And then that's how they sort of go about it. 68, for example, was a great year for movies, and maybe Rachel Rachel wasn't as well remembered in sort of the class, because you have classics, literal classics, like 2001, Space Odyssey, an amazing, you know, an incredible sort of historic movie, um, Rosemary's Baby, an all-time horror movie, Planet of the Apes, one of my all-time favorite sci-fi movies, Bullet, um, Thomas Crown Affair. I mean, there's so many great movies this year that sometimes when you think of your favorite movies from 68, you'll rattle those off and you'll forget about Rachel Rachel. And I think in terms of recommendations and, and people passing it on, and, and even if it comes down to the little things like you can't get this movie on Netflix. So a lot of ways, um, it, it's hard to get, get it to a new generation, but I do recommend it and I am uh, surprised by how well I enjoy this film. So that's about it, guys. Uh, I hope you enjoy the video. Make sure you comment below. Let me know what are some future, um, maybe movies you'd like to see covered on Forgotten for Oscar Films. Remember, we're moving backwards, 67 backwards. I'm having a lot of fun with the series. Uh, leave a comment below if you're having a great time with the series too. That's about it. I hope you enjoyed the episode. And until next time, stay tuned.